Hey, welcome to Overtime, where we take Sunday's message further. My name is Jeremy, and I'm your host. And this is a podcast where we just want to ask the questions that we think that you would ask as it relates to Sunday's message. And as we do so, we hope that it helps you grow in your life and your faith. With that being said, be sure to hit that subscribe button so you can stay up to date on all of the podcasts that are coming out. Not only that, hit the like button, because when you do so, it helps us help other people. And if you ever have a question about Sunday's content or about Overtime, you can submit those to overtime at npaustin.com, and we will be sure to get to those in future podcasts. So with that being said, here's a quick recap of Sunday, and then we're going to jump into our conversation today. What I want to talk about in our time today as we conclude this series on regret is what about the regrets that I already have? I want to look at Joseph's story because Joseph is actually kind of unique. He is faithful in all kinds of situations where you would think he would not be. It says when Joseph's brothers saw him coming, they made plans to kill him. As they kind of justify their levels of crazy, they're like, we don't have to murder him. We could just sell him as a slave. That will be better so that we're not murderers. And he's now, Joseph is now second only to Pharaoh. We have the seven years of good followed by the first two years of the famine. And now his brothers show back up again. When he looks into his brother's eyes and he says to them, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good, the saving of many lives. We're not Joseph in this story. Today, we're the siblings. Joseph says the bottom line for us is what you intend for harm, God can use for good. All right. Well, I guess all our flow is completely messed up now. Thanks for recording, Josh. Are you good? Now I'll, now I'll triple check. Yes. Okay. Including all of this. Yeah. Yeah. I know you are. Jamie, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Jeremy. No, yes. thanks for having me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, you know, this is over time, and we like to bring people on uh, whose sometimes their stories might uh, be a part of the topic we're going through in a particular series and stuff like that. And I know you, I know your story, and we are actually in an LDG group together, right. uh, leadership development group. But a lot of people who are listening might not know of you or know of your family and how you got engaged at North Point. So would you give us a quick synopsis of you, what you do, your family, and how long you've been at North Point. Yeah, uh, I'll keep some of the North Point stuff back because I think that's kind of an important part of my story. Sure, sure. Um, but um, we've been at North Point for about eight years, I think. We were still over in Parkside Elementary. Um, mm-hmm. So it's so our family is myself, my wife, Debbie. Uh, we have two kids. Our oldest is uh, Craig, and he is 24, married, living in Dallas. And then our youngest, Connor, she uh, is a college student, still lives with us at home, um, and she's about done with college, too. So um, I work, have worked for 25-plus years in the insurance industry, all in the claims. Pretty exciting. I <laughs> promise I'm not that boring. Yeah. Uh, maybe I am. I don't know. Um, but I uh, have always kind of worked in that field. Uh, we've been lived in the Austin area for like 16 years now, which is kind of hard to believe. I mean, this place was little. Wow. When we got here, and then here we are. Yeah, yeah. It's changed a lot in 16 years. It has. Yeah. And where are you originally from? So originally, uh, I grew up all over um, Nebraska and Iowa. Um, And um, junior high, high school, college was all in Lincoln, Nebraska. So um, grew up there and uh, went to school there. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you have a uh, fascination with IPAs. I certainly do. I have learned, uh, being in LDG together. And I always say LDG, I forget to, you know, preference leadership development group. It's a a men's group at North point that a lot of guys kind of get invited into and are a part of. And, you know, we meet once a month, we read a book a month and, you know, we're, we're, I guess like halfway through. Yeah. 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 You know, um, first of all, I do have gift for you. Oh, okay. And for our in studio host, Josh, uh, I have brought some beer. Nice. We will not have it on the podcast. No. It seems a little uh, <laughs> little strange to do that on a North Point podcast. But sure, sure. Um, yeah, LDG was something, you know, Shane Norcross had approached me multiple times to do it. Um, a big part of our family has been uh, baseball. Our, the Craigan played college baseball um, and a lot of time with baseball. Mm-hmm. And I just never, 
I always felt like I couldn't do it because in the spring, I mean, he played 250 some games in college, and I think I was at all but 15 of them. That's that was insane. Always, yeah, that was always really important to me. Absolutely. Yeah, that's cool. That's super cool. So it really, I, it never really lined up, but man, I'm really glad I'm in it right now. Um, I really see the benefit of kind of connecting. I think I'll talk about that a little bit um, when we get into it, but just the benefit of guys connecting with guys. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that. Um, Throughout my one of the, one of the things I know we're going to talk about regret real uh, through part of this, but one of the regrets I have is that just not really a connection with other guys my age a lot. Like I was connected with my wife, I was connected with my family, but not really like connections with with other men. Sure. And I feel like now that I've done it for like um, what are we about eight months in? Seven, eight months? Six, eight, seven yeah, months in? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, I have connections with guys that I never would have had other than passing at North Point. And it's not the same when you're in the couples group because I think there's so many things that guys won't talk about. Like, like I know, like, when Debbie and I have had marriage problems, we've gone to therapists, right? But, but you kind of know what the answer you're supposed to give there is. Yeah, yeah. Whereas, you know, a bunch of dudes going off on a retreat for a weekend, you, you kind of – get into some pretty heavy stuff and sure and people open up and and talk about like the stuff that's happened to them and I think it's that part of it's really big yeah well and on that note you know you get you know because we were at the retreat together you get to share together and then you get to hey man been there or you know I've experienced that or here's my story here's something that happened in my story and then you get to share a beer together <laughs> and yeah and it's that camaraderie that that comes with it that I think uh, is just super cool and super unique. Yeah, and dudes aren't real good about, like, we want to keep stuff kind of buried inside. And mm-hmm. I think it the great thing about um, just men in community with just other men at the time, it, it the authenticity and the transparency of it just goes up tremendously. Yeah, yeah, for sure, sure. So uh, back to my, my original silly question, IPAs, where did the fascination oh. of IPAs come from? Yeah, you know, that's a good question. I've always liked craft beer. And, and I, it's funny, um, I've always liked beer, and that's a little, you know, uh, never really had a problem with alcohol. We'll kind of talk about this story, but alcohol has always kind of been a, in my life, even as a younger person, and, and kind of led to some decisions. Um, but uh, I started out when craft beer kind of became a thing. I was really big into, like, Hefeweizens and wheat beers and things like that, mm-hmm. and then I started kind of moving more towards IPAs, and now that's really about the only thing I drink. Yeah. Um, and, and the hazier, the better. Um, so, you know, I'll have people come up to me, are you drinking orange juice? I'm like, no, it's not orange juice, but it looks like it sometimes. So, <laughs> But yeah. um, I am the ultimate in beer snobs. As you know, I get my beer delivered to the house. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sometimes a few beers, sometimes many beers. You're like one of those bougie coffee people, but with IPAs. Yes, Yeah. yes, which probably healthier to be the bougie coffee person i don't know maybe <laughs> moderation <laughs> everything in moderation yeah you know yeah. and i uh i save my my uh ipa time for the for uh, friday and saturday nights and there you go and usually at home yeah yeah there you go because you know me i kind of i turn my nose up a little bit on the uh, texas ipas i like to get my ipas yes. from california north dakota minnesota where the climate's a little more Hop friendly. How about that? Sure, sure. So. I feel like we could like just have a whole podcast oh, on this. The, I thought that's what it was. Oh, no, no, no. We're no. talking something different. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. We're going to get more serious? Yeah, just a little okay. bit. Okay. All little right. Bit. All right. Uh, so on a serious note, you know, we're in a yeah. series. We're, we're actually just finished up a series called No Regrets. And um, talking about regrets are, uh, they're not, we're all going to have them. They're not completely avoidable, but some are preventable. And so we've been talking about some things that uh, help us prevent regret in our life, but it's hard to do a series on this and not talk about regret that we have in our life because we all have it. You know, we've all, um, you know, made mistakes. We've all messed up. We've all hurt people we loved in some form or fashion. Um, and how do we reconcile those things with kind of the future of our life? And how do we reconcile those things with um, God's goodness and his redemption? And uh, Jordan spoke and he unpacked that really cool story with Joseph where it ends with, you know, what, what you intended for harm, God intended for good. 
And it kind of brings up this redemptive thing that a lot of people experience in their faith and their life um, with regret that they have. And as we were thinking about this podcast, I just know having heard your story, there's that redemptive piece is there. And it's it's a really powerful and really cool and I think just super encouraging uh, piece of your story, which is why we wanted to have you on the podcast. But I want to I want to kind of just discuss, you know, through through bits and pieces of it, if, if you're open to it. Um, first off, like the regret piece, like how is regret uh, been a part of your story? Pretty uh, broad question, but, you know, wherever you kind of want to start. Yeah. Um, you know, I'll say the, the biggest, one of the biggest regrets I have is, you know, Debbie and I didn't really kind of figure this whole marriage thing out until we've been married 26 na- years now. And probably like the last five or six have been, you know, by far, by far the, the best parts of our marriage. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that's kind of like, we missed out on like, like we were just kind of coexisting and kind of going through the motions, I think. And that's probably like, for me, one of my biggest regrets of the first 20 years that she and I were married is like, man, why were we, we were just always dealing with this stuff. Um, and really dealing with, um, I think, you know, I mean, like the biggest issue that I think led to every other issue in our relationship was, um, just all of our financial problems that, that were really, um, through both of our kind of makings, right? Like we both were responsible for it. If you know our story, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess we can kind of talk about that part of it a little bit and how we kind of got there. Um, you know, so pretty normal upbringing. I mean, I think, um, you know, very traditional family growing up where for the time period where um, my father, you know, worked outside the home. My mom raised the, myself and my my other two siblings and um, went to church every Sunday, grew up in the Lutheran church. My grandfather was a Lutheran pastor. Um that experience, you know, looking back on it, it was, it was very, um, I think similar to a lot of people that have been with the group when you, when you share stories, very, um, from, from our generation, it it was just kind of ritualistic in that you were kind of checking the box all the time, right? Like you were like every Sunday you got up, you did this, you went for an hour and you didn't really think about church that much after that. Um, and then like a lot of people in my, um, late teens to 40, I, I, I didn't have much. I mean, I always believed in God and always believed in Jesus and knew that, knew that I was religious, but I didn't, didn't really, um, have any engagement much with, with God, just very casually standoffish. The relationship piece wasn't there. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. The relationship piece wasn't there. Um, so I go to college and, um, I've always been one who's liked to have a good time. Um, school was always really easy, whether it was high school or college. So I had a lot of free time. Um, but the biggest thing that I came out of college with was, was a really pretty severe gambling problem. Um, you know, whether it was my bike, my mountain bike that my parents got me, my Sega, that'll date somebody, right? (laughs) Like a Sega system, you know, usually my fraternity brothers owned, owned it because I needed the cash to pay my bookie. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, um, part of that went away when we moved away from Lincoln for a while when, so, so Debbie kind of really didn't know any about really any of that at all. Really. Um, that part, I didn't share that part of our story. Um, my story with her, um, her and my relationship started kind of like a lot of my college relationships did in that, um, you know, we met at a bar and, my roommate was good friends with her. They went to a, a to a smaller school, and um, within five months, she and I were engaged. Probably would have been married pretty quickly. However, my poor in laws had two daughters engaged at the same time, so they had to pay for two <laughs> weddings at the same time. So, Debbie, being the youngest, um, we went second. Oh man! And so we were engaged for like eighteen months, long time. Yeah. Um, Three months after this, and so I, it, it, you know, our relationship started off a lot with, you know, mostly me being about me. I was going to do what I wanted to do. I mean, I think we talked about, we talk about that a lot at North Point. I mean, you know, about, um, and so, um, I didn't like my current job. 
um, and walked across the street. State Farm applied for another job. They hired me, and we, within three months, were moving to Sioux City, Iowa. Debbie's family has grown up their entire life on the same farm, and so moving this girl out of town was pretty traumatic for her, and we spent a lot of time running back and forth. Um, Sioux City was fine, though. I mean, I kind of got away from the gambling because I didn't really have that outlet. I didn't have access to it. Um, And then – but then there was a lot of – so just – Irresponsible finances kind of was the outcome of, of that. And so um, Craigan's born in Sioux City. I take a transfer back to Lincoln. So we come back home to Lincoln. Um, at this point, we've been married for three, three, four years. Okay. Um, still spending money that we don't have. Um, trying to keep up with the Joneses. Uh, new cars every other year, you know, roll whatever's left in that car. And it's, you know, yeah, yeah. just crazy stuff like that. And I fell in with a really good group of dudes at um, a local country club that was, you know, relatively inexpensive. When you think country club, you think pretty expensive, but relatively inexpensive. But still at this st- stage of life that Debbie and I are in with one little one, another one on the way. I don't need to be spending money playing golf and at a country club. And, and we're, so um, get back into that. And as you can imagine, golf and a bunch of guys, I get roped back. I kind of fall back into the gambling um, pretty heavily at that point. You know, I'm. Uh, it's not unusual for me to put a 1000 bucks on a round of golf or, you know, $150 on a hole on the backside. Thankfully, I was a good golfer. <laughs> Took a lot of money from my friends, yeah. uh, but I was gambling a lot of money on the other side. You know, I was using all that money to gamble with the other stuff. Kind of running concurrently with this, and I said earlier, you know, we bo- the the financial problems in our relationship were kind of were were made together. Um, Debbie and I are both product of kind of like first generational wealth. Our dads worked really, really. Our, our grandfathers, you know, didn't make a whole lot of money. Um. Our dads have both been very successful and both worked really hard. So I would say if you would describe Debbie and my growing up, it was pretty similar in that um, there wasn't too many times where Debbie and I got told no by our parents. Um, And then I still think generationally there wasn't a lot of conversation around, like with my parents around things like finances and, and, you know, your relationship with your spouse and things like that. It just, it just, for me personally, um, my dad is still one of my, um, best friends, but a lot of those conversations that I'm talking about happen, have happened probably in the last 10 or 15 years Mm. in more of like a shared setting versus, um, me, um, him kind of mentoring me as, as a person. Right. Now the, the the positive side of that is I kind of got a hold of that late, uh, kind of in Craigan's last couple years of high school, he and I have a pretty like I'm pretty direct with him about like hey dude don't do this do this you know kind of like this, don't don't end up doing the same things your mom and I did. Um, so I say that so I'm gambling out the one side with all our cash. Debbie, um, likes to buy things. <laughs> um, you know, and we've gone through Dave Ramsey's, you know, and anybody who's gone through Dave Ramsey, you're either a spent, most people are either a spender or a saver. Yeah. Debbie and I are both definitely both spenders. <laughs> um, we, we like to spend money. I mean, it's just the, who we are. Um, and so, um, throughout that whole cycle. So this goes on, um, probably for the next four years, a lot of gambling, hanging out with the same core guys, um, but just every single month, the meter, the debt level was getting higher and higher and higher. And then kind of the tipping point of, of, of that whole season was, um, every year I'd go on a golf trip with these guys and we'd go out and, um, you didn't pay until the Friday that you didn't pay at the one golf course. And I was like, Oh great. I don't have any money. Cause you know, we have all this debt, but on Friday I get paid and on Friday, I can do is when we go to this golf course, so I'll be able to pay. 
So my Friday morning starts out at seven o'clock. I just gotten paid. She's just gotten paid. So two paychecks hit our account. I go to pay for this uh, golf thing. It's like 200 bucks. It's not even a lot of money. My debit card won't go through. So basically we were overdrawn two full paychecks worth in our checking account at that point. Um, I vividly remember sitting in the back of a 10 passenger van as a third, I think I'm 30, about 30 at this point in the back of a 10 passenger van, just bawling my eyes out and having eight or nine of your best friends, dudes that, that think they know everything about you and they really know nothing about you. Right. Like, like, I was so inauthentic with them that they had no clue that, you know, that they were going to have to walk into this situation. Um, my good friend, John, who, um, really is still, um, one of my good friends from, we lived up really the only guy that I've kept touch with. I, I, I distinctly remember him, you know, in this really awkward moment, bunch of dudes around, no one really sure what to do. He crawled in the back seat, put his arm around me and just said, all right, we'll figure this out. And, you know, from that point, um, from that point, um, I had a couple small, minor relapses, Mm -hmm. but from that point I was pretty much cold Turkey done gambling. Um, yeah. Most people are surprised when I, you know, and, and so by that point, I think we have 60 to $70,000 in credit card debt. Wow. And you're still living in Nebraska? And we're or still uh, living in Nebraska at the time. Gotcha. Um, so throughout this whole process, um, Debbie and I are pretty disconnected. Um, I'd go to the golf course on Saturday morning. She's taking care of two little kids. Yeah. And when you had that van moment, uh, y'all have two kids or there's one on the way or there's... No, we still have that. So at that point, Connor, our youngest, she is probably two. Okay. And Craigan would be... And Craigan would be, what, six or seven? Probably first grade kindergartner. Gotcha. Um, And I'd go golf. She'd show up to the club, bring the kids. By that point, I'd already started drinking drink most of the rest of the day. So then of course we, um, kids would go home, guys would stay and play cards. I don't know how I got home. Sometimes my neighbor was one of the guys I was with. I mean, it was just stupid. And, um, I never really had a problem with alcohol and I still don't. Uh, it's just like, I could drop it like, like a problem in the sense that, you know, never missed a day at work, was never, you know, never late because of alcohol, but alcohol, alcohol was always around, right? Like, sure. like we were always, um, so this goes on, you know, for another couple years, um, really kind of, so I borrowed like $10,000 from my parents. That was really just kind of a band aid. We never really made any progress. Um, and then, um, Debbie gets an opportunity at work. And she ends up getting a promotion, and, and um, we move down here. And y'all are both at State Farm, right? So we're both at State Farm, correct. Yep. And so she's she's here. Um, she ends up being the facilities manager here at State Farm and um, here in Austin. And we show up with, um, we you know, we come down here. We know no one, right? Like, right. N- not a soul. And... Um, Craigan goes to school, and you have a pretty athletic, pretty um, big third grader in Texas, and suddenly I have, like, four dudes that want to be my best friend, you know, f- because they want Mike, they want Craigan to play on their football team. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. And that's typical Texas, As a third right? grader. As a third grader, yeah. yeah. Like, we're playing tackle football as third and fourth grader, which is kind of crazy to think about. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Good group of guys, but they probably enabled like good, and these were all couples. So, so it would be, it was suddenly these was became our community. friends. This is yeah. our new community, right? Um, really, really good people. Um, still friends with them a lot to this day. But looking back at it, on it, you know, the four or five couples, all of us were dealing with some pretty heavy stuff that 
in our own marriages. Yeah. But nobody was really dealing with anything, right? So right. like we were all just kind of self medicating and going and through the motions, running, going through the motions, and just kind of everybody was in the same season of life, right? Um. So um, again, probably another six, seven years of that. You know, we tried a couple churches here. Nothing really can, you know, we went to the traditional Lutheran church here nothing really connected. Um, and then, um, Cragen is, I think a sophomore or junior in high school. So this is like eight years ago and probably like in July. So in July, um, some stuff starts to come to light that happened years ago, um, back when we lived in Nebraska and kind of really becomes a, a big issue in our marriage. Um, something that, that like, okay. And, and still remind you, we're still in all this debt. Like, yeah. like even though Debbie and I are making really, really good salaries, making a lot of money, um, there's still tens of thousands of dollars. We're still in fifty, sixty thousand mm-hmm. dollars in debt between car loans, credit card debt. Um, miraculously, I, I will say, once you know we do get out the end of this at some point in this story, I didn't. De- we never defaulted on any bit of our debt, which is kind of <laughs> wild to think about, and the mental gymnastics that I had to do to to kind of get through that. <laughs> sure. But, um, so we're at a pretty big crisis point. We've been to marriage counseling a couple of times. Things would get better. Things would get worse. But there was always just this underlying tension of, um, of our finances and, and our debt and just kind of hanging over. And so I kind of, I, you know, through the, through Craig and years of growing up, um, you know, I would run with him to baseball stuff which kind of kept Debbie and I apart mm. um, and kind of, we were back in that same cycle of really not prioritizing our marriage at all. I mean, not going on vacation together, not really doing any, not dating each other, not doing anything. Um, so then, like I said, you know, some things come to light and um, through it all, I'm, I'm pretty convinced that this is in July by the mid July, I've made up my mind that, that I'm probably going to leave. I'm probably just like this. Our marriage is over. I'm, I'm going to be out the door. Um, lots of arguing, lots of shouting. Um, I would imagine the tension there at that point too, between marriage conflict, finances. Um, I don't know if gambling, yeah, you say gambling isn't a problem nope. at this point, but nope. the ramifications of it yep. ha- had been built up. And so there's a lot of, a lot of things to be pulling with and you're in a, relatively new place you know yeah high level of distrust too between you know you do something like that and you hide something like that from somebody that that should know everything about you for that long it's you're not really going to trust each other right right. Uh, or at least she's certainly not going to trust me yeah um and then we um um and then i realized you know i've packed a bag a couple times and each time I'm getting ready to leave, either Connor or Cragen is just, you know, hysterical beside themselves that, that what's going on. Yeah. Um, and then it really came to the realization, Jeremy, that if I leave, that's not going to go well for me. Right? I'm going to be, I think I said this in our group, I'm going to be a guy living in the van, taking a shower in the State Farm sprinklers, <laughs> you know, while Debbie and the kids are still living in our house. And so... yeah. Uh, you know, so that, uh, you know, the kids were probably really what held us in there, that last crucial moment until kind of the, the, the first kind of reach down from God moment, um, in our lives. So and, what, yeah. So what happened at that point? Yeah, what was the turning point? So about the same time that we moved to Austin. So we've been in Austin now for what, I guess, seven years, seven, eight years, about the same time we moved here, Jeremy Geist moved the Geist family moved to Austin as well and Jeremy Geist and Cregan were both really good athletes both kind of just became instant friends and so they've always been good friends um 
and North Jeremy, the guys, Jeremy and Jordan were just kind of getting involved really. Um, and I think you were getting involved at North point and Debbie was, Debbie was dealing with some pretty heavy mental health issues at this point. Um, and, um, I think it really for Craig and became trying to get help from mom um, at first. And so he got Debbie to, to go to North Point. And um, sorry. Um, Debbie, Debbie started going to North Point after she'd been in North Point for maybe three or four weeks. And she'd come home and she'd be like, I, you know, I, I really would hope, you know, I'd really like for you to go. And I was kind of just keeping her at arm's length. Like I was, really wasn't that interested. And then finally I did go. Um, and then probably like third or fourth message from, from that I was there from Buck was um, Buck talking about like, um, sorry, this kind of part gets me a little emotional. No, you're good. Um, you're good. At being angry in your heart um, and just knowing that you have to give like having all that anger and, and things is just not, not healthy. And, and, and you need to give that anger up and that just kind of, for whatever reason, again, I think the second time God reached down and touched me and said, Hey, you know, this is the way. <laughs> yeah. And, um, I remember, and Debbie, Debbie remembers this, a very vivid moment in, in, um, Parkside elementary, of all places. The cafeteria of all places. <laughs> yeah. Um, where Buck is, is, is giving this message and I reach over and grab her hand. And that's probably like the first caring thing I had done for her in who knows months. Mm. And I think that kind of, that, that time I look back at it, Jeremy, and that was like when it all started to turn around. Um, then we spent, you know, we, then it's just kind of been baby steps from there. Um, things got better at home. Um, I, we really, um, got involved with serving others and just kind of changing the whole posture of our life. Um, got into a community group and, and, you know, that first community group with, with the Pomeroy's and, the um, Eddings and, Judy and Lance Miller um, really turned us around, um, truthfully. Like, it was the first time I think Debbie and I were with other people that had a relationship with God already, but also had stuff and had been through their stuff, and you could talk about it, right? Yeah. And so, um, still financially hot mess. I mean, like, still just a total wreck. Like, we're not making any progress on getting anything paid for. Um, but at least we were on good ground. Um, next community group, which actually was, so Debbie and I went from there and Debbie and I led a community group. Um, and at the suggestion of one of the men or members, um, we did money matters and did, you know, Dave Ramsey and went through the whole thing as a group because a lot of us were dealing with the same thing, right? You know, same season of life, kids were getting older, like we're going to have to pay for college or we're paying for college. Or, and and, and yeah. so we started to adopt a lot of that stuff. Um, <laughs> but really in the last three years, it's kind of the crazy part of this whole financial piece, like where, where we're out the other side. Yeah. And, and um, Well, I want to stop you there too because okay. I think, you know, this, go, this goes to – thank you for sharing all that first. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, that's a lot. I of, felt like I talked a lot. Sorry. No, no. Hopefully, I, no one shut it off. They're like, I mean, Good Lord, when the question is, forever. "Hey, what's your story?" Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, if you've if you've lived some life, of course you're going to talk a lot. Uh, no, but I think you know th this is the part that, for me personally, I'm so grateful you're sharing, and also I think that um, is really encouraging because I think what a lot of people might expect at this point in your story is you go, and then we turned it around and we started, we got in a group and we fit, you know. Yeah. But I I know so much of that was y'all began to surrender things to God and it didn't necessarily get better um, in, in terms of, you know, when COVID hit and the ramifications of that in y'all's life. And there were some things that weren't necessarily kind of uh, logically yeah. making sense. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, but, yeah. And I, I want to talk about those because, you know, that's where that statement, um, what we intend for harm, like God uses for good. 
um, really comes to light. So, so go in, go into what happens next. I just wanted to more bring that up, you know, as part of like, I think this is such a beautiful example of, of when that happens. Yeah. So, um, Debbie and I are doing pretty, our relationship is, is, is really good at this point. Right. Um, our finances still suck, which still creates a lot of tension. Yeah. I mean, our marriage and is really kind of the one thing that always caused strife with us. Right. right. Um, and, um, I had worked for State Farm for 21 years and, um, my, my area, the, the area that I wanted to work in, um, was uh, just chosen kind of probably the first time at State Farm. There's been a bunch since that they've ever like let people go. Uh, in their, at that point, I guess it was almost 90 year history. Cause I think they've been around for a hundred years now. Um, I knew, um, I had the, so in our section, I had the second highest performing team first or second, depending on what, what key performance indicators you were going to look at. But I also knew I was kind of in a tough spot. Um, and, um, just because I lived in Austin, but led a team in San Antonio. Mm. And they really wanted people to get closer to their people in proximity, even though, you know, my least tenured team member was, had 19 years. They didn't really need me around. I mean, everybody knew it there. So I wasn't offered a job. Always had gotten great raises, always had gotten excellent performance reviews. I, they didn't offer me a job. And I'm making pretty good money really stable. Um, I wasn't very worried about it. I was a pretty technical job. And so I felt like I could go to work pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and also kind of where this goes is State Farm has a very, they're very generous severance package. Um, I got paid almost 18 months of pay to leave. Um, wow. And um, was only unemployed for like a month. So, um, but I got up every morning and I drove Uber and Lyft, Uber and Lyft for a month because I, cause one thing that hit me when I was 16, my dad, even though he was really successful, my dad lost his job when I was 16. Um, and I really remembered, it really stuck with me that my dad who had, who was an executive vice president at the bank when he loses his job or, you know, gets negotiates to lose his job. So he knew when his end date was, it wasn't mm -hmm. like it just dropped dead. He had it lined up to go scrub floors through manpower, a temporary agency the next Monday for 16 bucks for like eight bucks an hour, probably probably not even that much back then that, that really stuck with me. So I knew like I didn't have a job when the last day at state farm. Um, funny thing is Debbie tells a story. That's kind of funny being the spenders that we are. The first thing I did, the first thing I told her when I when I knew I was going to be leaving, I said, "Well, you know what? I'm taking the whole, f I'm taking some of my severance, and I'm taking the whole family to Hawaii." <laughs> <laughs> so here I am, don't have another job, lost my job, and I'm dropping you know money to take Craig and Connor on a fan and Debbie to. So we went to Kauai for like ten days. Nice. Paid, first time we ever paid cash for anything, which was pretty <laughs> incredible. Um, so. And then what's going on with Debbie's job at this point? So too? Debbie's fine. Debbie's still, her job's not impacted in any way, you know, not at all. So this is, um, so then I go work for, I go to work for Nationwide really shortly after that. So that's kind of the first little piece of it is I go to work right away. So we took a lot of this money and paid down a bunch of debt. Still got plenty, but we paid down a bunch of it. Um, so then I worked for nationwide for a while. Then I worked for a startup here in Austin and the very, really the same kind of thing. Didn't work there very long, but I had kind of lucked into, cause I didn't negotiate at all. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. I'd work for these corporations for ever. Right. And they're also parental. They just take care of you. And you know, you don't really think about like negotiating your salary and things like that. And right. so, um, I ended up with some, some pretty good, good equity and a company that went public and they didn't have a really great exit, but they had a good enough exit for me for 18 months. So I got a really nice bonus for only working there 18 months before I switched to where I'm at right now. Um, 
So we took that money um, and, well, let's back up a little bit. Before that money happened, we knew this. So then Debbie's trugging right along for three years and COVID hits. So COVID, as we all know, kind of turns the whole world upside down. Nobody needs to be in a facility. And so about a year into COVID, they tell Debbie that, hey, we're not going back into any of these facilities, so you and your entire team will be um, severed from the company as well. So at 20 years, she loses her job. Um, looking for a facilities manager job in the middle of uh, COVID, it's not, not, not ideal, thing. right? Like people yeah. are not coming back. And so she put on a good face, but I think she was pretty stressed about it. I wasn't very stressed about it. Um, she and I have pretty different personalities. She comes kind of from a family of warriors a little bit. I come from a, ah, we'll figure it out kind of thing. Mm. Sometimes to our own detriment, right? Because it makes you not as reliant on others. I think we talked about that. Um, and she ends up, she ends up being unemployed for a while. Now, part of it was her own choosing because it was Craig and senior year at Dallas Baptist. And so we wanted to, she wanted to make sure she didn't miss anything. And, right. and um, so we held on to that money. Um, and then in August of last, last year, July of last, August of last year, the company I worked for, even though I wasn't there, I bought their stock options when I left, they went public. So between, I guess this is the, the, the redemption part of the story, um, between her and I losing um, our jobs and me switching jobs, we, with all that money, we paid off all our debt except we just have the mortgage left. So two kids' schools totally paid for, all the cars were paid for. Wow. So the only thing left is the house. So... And how, how did, how did like, with your finances in that area of your life, how did uh, your relationship with God kind of play into yeah, all of that? Yeah, that, that's, thank you for reminding me. Um, through this period and, and through our relationship with North Point and our community group, um, we, you know, we grew up in, Debbie and I both grew up going to church, grew up with families who gave a lot of money to church. Um, so, so tithing wasn't really like something that was foreign to us. Right. Um, but it was not something that we ever did. Um, even probably in our first four or five years at, at North Point. Um, just because we couldn't, right? Like our finances were just a mess. Right. But you know what? We finally decided even when our finances were a mess. That I remember one time driving home from, I think here, I think we were here. Um, Debbie said, Hey, we need to start giving money to church. Like we're so blessed. We have such high salaries that, that it's time. And, and, and I think she and I both adopted kind of a posture of, of kind of, um, open hands instead of kind of, you know, the holding it fast and, and truly in our lives, um, I, I can say that kind of the blessing, you know, that you hear people talk about how blessings flow in and out of open hands. And I think that's, that's really true. Debbie's always had a generous heart. I mean, like if we drive by, you know, someone who needs my, I mean, she'll, she'll give someone money and, and share that I've, I, that it took me a little while longer to come along with that. And now, you know, I think that's the really cool part about it now, Jeremy, that, you know, um, kind of changing that mindset. I really kind of enjoy helping others financially and things like that and, and yeah. being generous and, not, yeah. you know, and, um, I think, you know, a little bit about me now. I, I do like to dabble, with some of uh, the stock market and trading and things like that. And, you know, it, 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 it allows us to do what we want to do and, 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 and be generous with others and, sure and, and really trying to, trying to, um, instill that mindset in my children. I mean, I think that's the greatest thing for me is like, I look at like Craig and Connor and go, man, as screwed up as Debbie and I were, they're pretty darn good kids. Like, like Craig and kind of has it all figured out and Connor's getting there and yeah. And, um, 
but I like think it's because their parents are kind of real with them. Yeah, for sure. Well, that's one of the, I remember when I first heard your story, I thought it was such a cool, that's that redemptive piece that, you know, we're kind of hitting on in this podcast is, um, you talk about making that decision to give when things were not good <laughs> yeah. and like all that, you know, and it's a decision to trust God in the midst of it, like not making sense, you know, and, and especially when you look back on your financial history, you're still going like, we're going to give money. There's, there's nothing logical about that, about yeah. that decision. You know what I mean? But then what then transpired in y'all's life and to where, you know, you talk about today, um, only, you know, mortgage being the only debt, like, I mean, the, the amount of dominoes that would have had to fall to create all that and to the point where, you know, your job today and then Debbie being on staff at North Point now, because we were the crazy ones hiring a facility director during COVID. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but there's just enough dots and dominoes that you connect where you just see like, in a way, I mean, you really see the sovereignty of God kind of playing itself out and where he began to really be a part of, I don't know, y'all's finances, y'all's relationship, all those things. Yeah, and, I, and, and you know, it, it's funny you say that because I think we kid ourselves if we don't think that, like, our relationships, especially a, a, a relationship as intimate as spouses, um, isn't impacted by every piece of it, right? And so, like, to your point, there are, like, seven or eight different times that I can just, I just know that God was at work in my life and this has been his plan all along. Um, and I, and I really feel like, and I've said this before, I, I feel like it's been his plan all along because I've always been kind of an open book guy, even more to my, like, like sometimes to my own detriment. I, I I'm not afraid to be vulnerable and authentic with people, but I kind of feel like he, he put, me and us through some of this. So we do talk about it. So people understand that like there are people that you can relate to and, and talk to and like, like no judgment. Right. I mean, I think that's the greatest thing about our, our, our men's group is, you know, not once in that room and when 10 guys are telling their story, not once did I sit there and go, wow, that's really messed up. I'm glad I'm not messed up as that guy, <laughs> you know, right. Right. Cause we are all messed up as that guy. Just, with our own stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, you know, you look at, I just think I've been lucky and I don't know why. And I, I would have to guess that I'm not very predisposed, um, to, to having, I just have never really had a lot of mental health issues, but, but I do know, like I have a lot of friends that do and, and just, you gotta have somebody to talk to. And so, and, and sometimes it's okay if it's just your buddy. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. For sure. For sure. One, one of the things, you know, that that we hit on in the series, I mean, one community being one, I mean, a lot of what you've said in this podcast and having the relationships, you talk about John and the van, um, you talk about community group at North Point. Uh, that's why we wanted to put community as a part of the series, because it really is one of the biggest things in life that can lead you to uh, meeting you in those you know, moments that would lead to no regrets or meeting you in those moments that would lead to those like turning points. Uh, one of the things Jordan talked about this this week, and I want to end with, with this question too, is it can be difficult to look at our past and disassociate our identity from what we've done and not allow that to kind of hang on to who we are today. Um, as you think about, you know, struggles with you and Debbie, you know, the financial story y'all have had, all the things, how have you disassociated your identity and who you are today um, from what you've experienced in the past? Yeah, that's a really good question. You know, I, I even even though you've given it to me before this, <laughs> <laughs> and I've looked at it in the moment trying to think of an answer. No, I'm, uh, you know, I, I think the biggest piece for me, and I've heard, and I think we've all heard this saying that, like, you know, none of us are as good as our 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 best decision. And conversely, none of us are as bad as our worst time, right? Right. right? Um, I, you know, I, I think it, I think it really comes back to finding people, whether it's somebody in your family or whether it's your whole family. I, you know, um, your spouse, your your 
your friends, um, you know, people that love you and love on you with all your warts and, and cause I'm not sure I wouldn't, I'm not sure being in the moment now and getting to the place I am right now. I'm not sure that, um, while I know it definitely doesn't define me as to who I am, I don't know that I would want to go back and not have that happen. Mm. Because I think, you know, like especially Debbie and I talk about this a lot um, now. Um, we talk about, like, would things be as good as they are right now for us if we hadn't slugged our way through all of that stuff? And what you learned from a result of that. Yeah. 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 Um, I know I'm a much nicer person. Um, I'm a much more patient person because all that stress is gone. You know, all that, all that financial stress is gone. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I, I think it's Jeremy about, you know, really just talking it out and being with people. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't really know any other way. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think that's one thing that, um, you know, in our, in our men's group that the very first book we read, which I was, was excellent. Uh, Bo's cafe for anybody out there. I'd, especially for men, it's really kind of written for men. If anybody wants to pick up a book and read, I've actually recommended it to one of my buddies, um, who does not go to North Point but was having some marital problems. I'm like, dude, you need to read this book. Um, and um, I I didn't have enough male, f- like really authentic male friends for about 10 years of my life. Mm. And that really, it, it's, it's interesting. I have no doubt that that was very much to the detriment of my relationship with my wife and my kids. Mm. Because... I felt like I was doing it. I could do it on my own, right? Like I, I, I got this. I'm like, I'm, you know, I'm Musa, Mufasa, and you know, <laughs> we can, we can do this. We don't need anybody else's help, and that's just really not true. I yeah. don't think. Um, the coolest thing, um, and we talked about this a little bit on a retreat. Um, the coolest thing for me is I've had three maybe four people in the last five months reach out to me former and they're all former coworkers, men who have had, um, something happen in their marriage and they've reached out to me and said, Hey, will you, can we get together? Can we talk? I just want to know how you got through it, how you got to the other side. And, um, there's no way that happens by chance. There's just no. There's just, you can't convince me that I'm not somehow supposed to tell my story so somebody hears it and reaches out for help. And there's just no way. It's just, it, it can't be that coincidental. Yeah. What, w- what would you say to somebody, you know, having had some of those um, conversations with people who are hurting, trying to figure things out, um, what would you say to somebody who's just feels like they're in a pit, feels stuck in regret, lonely? Yeah. Um, you know, I think when I look back uh, at, at like some of the, the regret that I had and what led to kind of some of the decisions I made, it was generally around um, as I got some distance from it, like being reflective about owning my part of it. Um, I'd say definitely that was the piece that getting through the, the, the real crisis with Debbie and I was um, just really owning each of us, owning our side of it and, and, and understanding where it was. And then I think a lot of people that get in that situation, Jeremy with regret and, and in that real pit, it's because, they feel like someone has done something to them. And, and I'll tell you that there is, in my opinion, no bigger power in anything in forgiving someone else. Mm. I mean, I, I truly believe that. Um, it's not always easy. Um, generally worth it, I think. Yeah. 
Well, I feel like that's a good place to wrap up. That's a good piece of wisdom to leave everybody with. Uh, Jamie, thank you so much for yeah. coming on the podcast, Appreciate sharing it. your life, your story, being vulnerable in this in this kind of uh, setting. I know it takes a big um, leap of trust and faith, so I um, greatly appreciate it. I appreciate it, Jeremy. Thanks for having me. Yeah, and we'll, we'll see everybody for this coming Sunday. We're kicking off a new series. We'll either see you online or in person. Thanks.